Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Front-loading, crossover primaries, caucuses, soft money. The presidential selection season is upon us and all eyes are on the White House 2000 horse race. But how does a candidate actually win his party's nomination? What are the rules behind the political game? We've been hearing bits and pieces of information on television and in the editorial columns, but in the next half hour, we are going to try to put this whole crazy quilt together. Joining Think Tank to shed some light on the American nominating system are William Mayer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Northeastern University in Boston and editor of in Pursuit of the White House 2000, How We Choose Our Presidential Nominees. Ronald Walters, professor of political science at the University of Maryland and author of Black Presidential Politics in America, A Strategic Approach. And Elaine Kamark, executive director of the Visions of Governance for the 21st Century Research Program at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and a top policy advisor for Gore 2000. The topic before the House, picking a president, this week on Think Tank. The 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago was marked by riots and unrest. Many young people, women and black minority Democrats, claimed they were left out of the party's decision-making process. They said the party bosses manipulated the outcome. Knock it off, will you please? Ultimately, they took to the streets in protest. In the wake of the 1968 convention, the Democratic National Committee established the McGovern-Fraser Commission, originally chaired by Senator George McGovern, to reform the nominee selection process. The commission and its successors require that the states have explicit written rules for choosing their convention delegates. New rules also called for proportional allocation of delegates rather than the winner-take-all system that had been prevalent in the past. The reforms prompted new state laws, many of which reformed the Republican nominating process as well. Since these reforms, the number of states holding open primaries instead of closed caucuses has skyrocketed. In 1968, there were 17 Democratic and 16 Republican primaries. But this year, 40 states will hold Democratic primaries and 43 will hold Republican primaries. As states struggle for influence in the nominating process, the primary season has been truncated. The majority of both parties' convention delegates will have been selected and allocated by March 7th, five full months before the national party conventions. How will Al Gore, George W. Bush, Bill Bradley, John McCain, and the others fare in this year's fast-paced complex and chaotic season. For answers and explanations, we turn now to our expert panel. And let's just do a series of questions and get some answers out there for our, our, our wonderful viewers. How important is this idea of front-loading, of moving the primaries toward the earlier part of the year? Elaine Kmark, if you could begin. Uh, this is probably the most front-loaded season we've had historically, although the trend has been in this direction, as you know, for some time, Ben. And what's interesting about it is that we used to write, I wrote in my doctoral dissertation, Bill has written, we've all written about, the, about momentum in presidential primaries. Big and Mo. Big Mo. And right. when I first wrote about momentum, it was, it was a phenomenon that would occur over a period of four or five months, you know, from one set of primaries to another to another. And this kind of front loading means there will still be momentum, certainly coming out of Iowa and New Hampshire, but to a certain extent, it all happens at once. It's almost like we have a national primary, is, which is, is it, an idea that's kicked around right. for many years. Is this good or bad, Ron? I think it's uh, probably bad, um, primarily because when you look at the ability of the average citizen uh, to have uh, an understanding of the process and the issues, 
and to have some of the time of the candidate uh, vested on them, it's impossible. Uh, if you have a state, for example, like California, uh, that moves its primary up, it's a big state, uh, cost a lot of money to campaign the state uh, because you have to cover a lot of people with your issues. You move that up and you put it uh, where you've got all the other states, it means that you have this tremendous challenge of how do you, how do you get your message out? How do people really understand so who it, you it, are? It advantages the well-known and the wealthy candidates. Already, that's right. Those mm -hmm. who already have a presence and have the ability, the financial ability, to actually campaign right. simultaneously in now, a number I, of places. I, I was looking through the calendar. Am I correct that after Iowa and New Hampshire on the Democratic side, there's a full month before New that's Hampshire? Right. There that's is right. a full five month. Weeks. So, full month. How much? About five weeks. About five weeks. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, uh, you have these two showcase primaries and the big mo either builds or doesn't build and you mm -hmm. have some time. That one yeah. decision by New Hampshire, New Hampshire was originally going to go in late uh, February, has really made it very difficult to, to say how front, has, has sort of, I think, slightly scrambled the, 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 the extent to which this year is front loaded. It is front loaded once you start at March 7th, but in fact this uh, gap after New Hampshire is really kind of unprecedented. But, but that is true only on the Democratic only side. Only on the Democratic on the, side. The, the, the Republicans then go immediately, what, to Delaware, South Carolina, right. Michigan, and then they pick up... Even they have right. a fairly relaxed schedule up mm -hmm. until March 7th. They've got only three or four major events after mm -hmm. New Hampshire. Okay, now, uh, we, we've raised the question of money. Uh, it was said earlier in the year that, well, nobody could touch Bush, nobody could touch Gore because they have all the money. How important, once you reach a certain threshold, the way John McCain and Bill Bradley have, how important is money in this system? Well, I think it's, it's I mean, the, the unavoidable fact is if you want to run for president in a country that has 280 million people, I think it's very important. Uh, it is... I'm not sure that, that uh, the threshold I actually think is quite high, and I'm not sure that McCain has in fact reached it but, yet. But, but more or less unknown candidates like Bradley and McCain were able to accumulate substantial amounts of money. I mean, yeah. a, a, to give them the ability mm. to run, which was not necessarily yeah. expected. Mm -hmm. I, I, think that mm. the, I think the real question, and this year will be a good test of it because George Bush has so much money. The real question is not how much money do you need? Because I think there's a consensus that you, you need to be able to raise about $20 million to be kind of a credible candidate. I think the real question is going to be, what do increments above that do for you? If George Bush gets upset by John McCain um, and manages to either have to fight for the nomination or even loses his nomination, I think we will have learned that very, very large amounts of money don't, in the end, overcome advantages like momentum. And that, I think, will be uh, one of the most interesting things about this season. Well, I think one thing here is uh, important with respect to people who are unknown, or who, people who actually need uh, to increase their name recognition. Uh, you, you talk about Bradley, for example, in the South, and you talk about McCain uh, in the Northeast. Uh, they need money because one of the things it does is to help them field an organization. Uh, so it's not just television. Uh, it is the ability to compete on the ground and make yourself known. And you can't do that without substantial amounts of money. So one of the things that buys you is the ability to put a field operation into play, which helps you become more well known among the voters. How important really is this organization? You hear, oh, he's got organization. I mean, how do you organize 270 million people? Or, or I mean, is that sort of, a, I mean, it's particularly if you take a place like California with 35 million people, uh, these seven or eight huge media markets, nobody's going to organize that. You're going to put your money on television. You're going to get a lot of the so-called free media. It, are, are we, is this just sort of some relic in the closet? I don't think so. Uh, I'd just say that there is a combination here of the people that you pay for that are in your organization on the ground. But you don't depend upon those people. You've got uh, uh, elected officials, for example, who or may have endorsed you. They use their campaign organizations. And so the party puts money in, the soft money, you know, and, and that has an effect. You, you worked on Reverend Jackson's political campaign. Yes. My, my, my sense is that that was not, an or and he did very well, particularly, I guess, in 1988. 
and that was not because of organization. That was because he caught a media wave and he had apparently something to say uh, to a lot of people. Not really. If you look at uh, Detroit and Virginia, for example, uh, the ability to have an organization in those states and to win those caucus states is extremely states, important. Right. Yeah. Right. So that in those states, Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about organization. Well, and I, I think it, it depends a little bit on the size of the state. Clearly, organization is very important in caucus states. Um, right. Somebody but it's also define in small caucus. Primary S states. Somebody define caucus, Bill. Mm -hmm. Caucus is one of two mechanisms that are used for selecting delegates. In primaries, it's a normal. It's it's an election. People walk in and they elect delegates. In caucuses, they are essentially town meetings held in every precinct people show up and what they elect are delegates who then go on to a state or a district convention and it's only there that the actual numbers, but, but uh, the, the actual delegates are selected. Uh, unlike a primary election where you go into a booth and cast a ballot and it takes five or ten minutes, you end up at a caucus spending the whole evening and you vote in public, is that right? right. There are right. a couple of differences. They last yeah. longer, uh, you vote in public and one of the other huge differences is the turnout. Typically uh, primaries have a turnout between somewhere 20, 30 and per 20 to 30 percent. Caucuses, uh, with the single exception of Iowa, typically have a turnout of about 2 or 3 percent. I, I mean, this could, uh, Iowa, Elaine, you don't have to answer this because you have a candidate running in and coming up, but, but I mean... I love Iowa. Yeah, I'm sure you do, <laughs> but, 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 but the, uh, the Iowa caucuses have always sort of reminded me of the Leningrad primary in the old Soviet days. I mean, you have to stand up <laughs> and say this is how I vote. Well, that's I mean, right. that's not a, a real election, is it? Well, yeah, it's not, it's, yeah, it's not ahead. as, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's not an election, but it is an exercise. I mean, the notion that democracy only operates when you do it in, in, in secret is, is, is yeah. I think, uh, that's right. cer certainly something that, yeah. that, that I disagree with. Uh, you disagree with that? Well, I mean, town, a, secret, a secret ballot, meetings, a secret ballot, what well, could be well, more, then, uh, Secret, ba secret ballots are appropriate in some circumstances, mm -hmm. okay. but they aren't appropriate in uh, Congress. They aren't appropriate in town meetings. Usually, they aren't considered appro. They weren't considered appropriate in Athens. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's a little bit uh, okay. We hear a lot about the role of party bosses, so-called. Is that <laughs> still in play, or is that another relic? You know, I, I, I think that's another era. I really yeah. do think that's another era. I don't know of very many people, particularly in a presidential race, who can mm -hmm. deliver blocks of votes for a candidate in the way that I think you and I think of, say, the, the Mayor Daley in Chicago, the, the previous Mayor Daley being able to deliver. Um, I, I, th I, think it's an, I think it's a bygone era. Uh, with TV and lots of media, I think that people make up their own minds who they're going to vote for for president. I, I buy that because, you know, when you uh, look at the system under which the bosses operated, a lot of them were caucus systems. And uh, if, you, if you're in Detroit and you had to go vote at uh, the UAW Union Hall, you know, you were very circumspect who you voted for. With, with Bill's uh, non-secret ballot. With his uh, non-secret you know, uh, Well, well, uh, actually, uh, hoisting democracy, right. Thing. And it's the same thing with Daley, uh, who often, uh, in his uh, precincts, had policemen standing there. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now, you know, it gave you a sort of sense of realism <laughs> about casting a vote. So this old boss system has been democratized uh, by the passage of some of the laws that you talked about earlier, the democratization of the primary system. And this has had a tremendous effect on dissipating the power of bosses. You know, uh, <coughs> the, the fabled and legendary Bob Strauss was asked, this is really a couple of decades ago, whether, you know, he as, quotes, a party boss could deliver the vote. And he said, I can't even deliver my wife's vote. I mean, it's really been somewhat of a fable, I think, yeah. all along. I think right? that's, that's yeah. in general true. But I, I, I think endorsements of party leaders, major government officials, are still important in a couple of indirect ways. They give you credibility, both with the voters and with the media. Uh, they help in terms of your fundraising. And uh, I also think that the one group that whose, whose endorsement may, may be especially important are governors, because governors often do have something of a 
uh, a skeletal organization around them. And in a state like New Hampshire, for example, I think the, uh, the endorsement of the governor can often be uh, you know, a valuable prize and, to and, get. And in, uh, but that's very different from being a political boss. Oh, I'm not too, I that's agree right. completely that's on right. that score. Yeah. I, I agree. The, yeah. the well, you can be both. You can be an elected governor. Sense, Mayor Daley was an elected mayor, and he was, quote, right. a yeah. party boss. That's right. I, that's right. But I agree. You can't deliver. The, no, no, party, no party leader can and, deliver and in, in the George way that George W. Could. Bush's case, his whole candidacy was really... Uh, developed and energized and created in the Republican Governor's Caucus. And on the Democratic side, I think all of the institutional support that Gore got had a lot to do with, with scaring a lot of other Democrats out of the race. Well, mm -hmm. let's go to another question that always comes up. How important are these endorsements? I mean, the answer in the negative is President Muskie. I mean, you know, he had all the endorsements and he got creamed. Uh, so how important are they? I mean, uh, Elizabeth Dole just uh, recently endorsed George W. Bush. Does that mean anything? Is anybody going to go say, oh, well, Elizabeth Dole endorsed him. I'm for Bush over McCain because Elizabeth Dole or anyone else. Does this, I mean, the governors are sort of separate because they may be able to deliver a working organization. But other than that, does it matter? I, look, I, I think they're important in this new system. I think they're important in a different way. I think the endorsements are important because they give voters cues about the candidate and what people like about the candidate. So when a candidate get, gets supported by people that he or she worked with in the legislature or by his or her fellow governors, what, it, what's, what it's saying is, okay, this person has the respect of their peers. And I think it makes a marginal difference in terms of conveying that the person is solid. You know, part of the trouble in every presidential race is some candidates have to get over the presidential threshold. There are some candidates in the Republican race this time who clearly are not getting over the threshold of being credible as president. And I think what endorsements do is they say, okay, well, this is somebody who's credible, who's respected by their peers. Well, I'm not sure it does much else. I, no, I, I disagree with that assumption. I think you're right about the symbolic value of endorsements. But there are some endorsements that are real. For example, if you look at labor, uh, the kind of endorsement that labor gives leads to bodies in the field, oh, well, that's true. manning the telephones and, does, and those yes. sorts of things. And you find that among a lot of politicians. The other, of course, uh, if you look at the Democratic side yeah, of the and National Rifle Association, something the like NRA, that. The NRA. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot right. of these groups that, that are it. sort of people-oriented right. and have a vast network of operatives. Uh, you want to get their endorsement. Pro-life, both, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's right. No, no. But, but, but the other one I started to say was um, had to do with uh, superdelegates on the Democratic side. Oh, right. Uh, if That's you look at uh, the endorsement of uh, many of these people, uh, they lead to votes. Uh, and as a matter of fact, to, to, to delegate votes. To delegate votes. The, the, this is, in, in brief, uh, in the Democratic side at, at least, all the members of Congress, all the Democratic governors, right. and all the Democratic... State party officials. All the members office. of the Democratic National Committee. Where there are about That's 800 right. appointed delegates, That's right. and they vote with no reference to ha necessarily with how their state voted. That's right. And one of the uh, candidates who shall be unnamed now has about a quarter <laughs> of them locked up. Uh, so that that's very important. More than that for the uh, more, for, more for than vice that? president unnamed. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, for an unnamed vice president, <laughs> yes, he has more than that. Well, We're not supposed to be part of it. Out of the 800, something like he 600? He has a lot of them. I don't, I don't, I'm I not quite sure, but he has a lot of them. Yeah. No, I mean, a, a quarter of the entire delegates needed. Oh, oh right. Oh, I see. Yeah, right, right, right. absolutely. Far more of the super delegates. That gives him a tremendous head start in this process. The only thing I... But I would say five hundred. Give us the but, Bill. <laughs> the but is that I think whether to begin with that that only gets you a quarter of the way, and and, and I think mm -hmm. in the end what will really be decisive in this election, as in previous ones, is what happens in the primaries and caucuses. I mm -hmm. think it's most unlikely that if Bradley should win a majority of the votes in the primaries that all of those superdelegates that are now in Gore's camp will stay there. I think instead, mm -hmm. a lot will come to him and say in one way or another, listen, Al, we liked you, we supported you, but the voters didn't, and we've got to abide by that verdict. We have been talking about what viewers might have been hearing on television or in the newspaper columns. Now I want to ask you about something that they will hear. I, I will certify here and now that the week before the primaries, when you start actually grilling the pundits and the election experts, they're going to say, well, it depends on turnout. 
Right. I mean, <laughs> that's the classic, uh, mm-hmm. the classic uh, electoral scam. Now, uh, h- how does that work in primaries? I mean, it is not, you do not have huge percentages of the population coming out, do you? No, you have about one third of the electorate that you're going to have in the general election coming out in the primary, and so it's uh, it's representative, but it's tough to extrapolate from. And, the primary and but in so other words, if only fifty percent of the eligible voters that's vote. Right. This is a third of the 50. That's about a third of the so 50. That's right. 15, 16, 17 percent, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Well, small, I mean, it's, they are low turnout elections, primaries are. And, of course, some states, you have to be a registered Democrat or a registered Republican to even be able to vote in the first place. So that shrinks the universe even more. So these are, these are low turnout elections. And what it tends to do is if you have a particularly intense base of the party, that's for one candidate or another, that can certainly help that candidate in a primary to the ex- in a way that it may not help that candidate in a general election. So I think most of the evidence recently suggests that presidential primaries are, more, are, are reasonably representative of the party membership as a whole. I mean, that was one of the great fears originally. And I think most of those, you know, there are some differences at the edges, but basically, uh, they are reasonably representative. The caucuses are not. The caucuses are clearly unrepresentative. And, and that's changed. You know, Can I just point out? That's sure. changed over time. Because if I remember true. the early work by Lengel and Schaefer on this, in mm. 76, the primaries really didn't look like the general election. And over time, and I think as more people got used to this new system, the primaries mm-hmm. got closer in the demographic profile to the general election. Okay. Now, uh, let's go around the room. The end. Uh, Let me ask one question. Let me get a brief answer. There have been these massive changes in how we select a presidential nominee, driven by this history that we saw at the beginning of the show. Has this been a salutary development for our democracy? Well, I suppose... That means good. Yes. I always have to remind my academic friends of these big big words that that I use. That was the reason I was pausing. I was going to say that, that... it's brought good and bad. I think uh, it's, it's allowed more people to participate. Uh, I think it has had a lot of very negative consequences. It has made the races longer. It has, in an indirect way, uh, resp- it's uh, responsible for front-loading. Uh, I think it means that institutional parties aren't as important. Uh, having said that, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to suggest that you could simply you know, turn the clock back, but, but I think on the whole, I, I'd say the, the changes have been more negative than positive. More positive than negative. Uh, I think that when you look at, uh, at least the Democratic Party, that scenario, which goes from Fannie Lou Hammer all the way up through the Jackson campaign, uh, you've had tremendous openness in the Democratic Party that you would not have had if you hadn't had rules to that effect. Uh, so I would say that they have had uh, the impact of bringing in far more people into the process now, or at least allowing that to happen. I am not one who believes that simply by tinkering with the rules that you can affect that. And so I believe that uh, there are far many other factors responsible for participation and tinkering with the rules. The old Mayor Daley always used to say, you write the rules, I'll win the election. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) and he he did. He did, yeah. Elaine, good or bad? I I think it's been good. I mean, it's hard to imagine in this day and age a, an election process where it's controlled by a small group of self-appointed people. I mean, I think that just the yeah, but, modern... But they, they, they were not really. I mean, that, that was an anti-Humphrey myth in, in the, that, that these were, right. were self-selected. I mean, they came up through the electoral process. They, came up the process. they were Mayor indirectly Daly, Mayor Daly was elected six times. Yeah, they, they, they well, were all, indirectly my, my representing only, my the only, voters. My right. only point is that I think that people in this day and age feel that they have enough information to make their own decisions and not delegate those decisions to somebody, even somebody who was elected. I agree with uh, Ron and Elaine that this has been essentially a positive development because, you, look, you've got to pick a president somehow. Somehow. A- and this is as much fun, it's a little crazy, yeah. as any other way. And it does give people a certain feeling that no matter who it ends up with, at least there was a a process and i if i wanted to i would have been able to play okay thank you uh, bill mayer elaine kmark and ron walters and thank you we at think tank encourage feedback from our viewers via email it's very important to us 
One viewer, Diane in Chevy Chase, Maryland, recently had this to say about our program on Norman Rockwell. Because he was only a wonderful illustrator, his critics have sought to exclude him from the ranks of artists. He who works with his hands is a laborer. He who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman. But he who works with his hands, his head, and his heart, like Rockwell, is an artist. I agree. Thanks for writing. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1219 Connecticut Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.